As we began today's Mass with the procession, we read a passage from the Gospel of Mark in which Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a borrowed colt on which no one had ever ridden. We end the passage of the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark with Jesus being placed in someone else's tomb. He came through this life with nothing of his own, yet he offers to us unimaginable riches, especially for those who are willing to look beyond the present moment towards the kingdom which he proclaims. In the story of Jesus preparing to enter Jerusalem, he gave his disciples explicit directions about where they were to find this donkey and what they were to say to the people who questioned them when they tried to loose that donkey. In the Passion narrative, Jesus gives explicit directions about where the Passover meal is to be celebrated, how they are to find the owner of the house and where they are to go to follow him. It's as though this whole story has been scripted centuries before Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And indeed it had been, and revealed gradually through the prophets. Jesus realized that he was fulfilling words spoken about him centuries earlier. But Jesus was not playing a part. Jesus was fulfilling his own mission in obedience to the Father. On the first day of Lent, when we marked ourselves with ashes as a sign of repentance, we were also instructed in the gospel not to be hypocrites. In the Greek word it is used in the New Testament, hypocrite means an actor. Don't just play a part. If you wear the ashes on your forehead, commit yourself to conversion. If you come to Mass on Sunday and receive the body and blood of Christ, commit yourself to becoming more and more like Christ. If you receive the body of Christ, become the body of Christ. Jesus was not an actor playing the parts. The blood was real. The abandonment was real. The sense of agony facing the torture that was impending upon him was very real. So real that he could ask his father, is there another way? So real that he could even feel temporarily an abandonment by his own father, even though he and the father are one. The Gospel of Mark has often be de been described as a passion narrative with a long introduction. Throughout this year, we've been reading Sunday after Sunday from the Gospel of Mark. Everything leads to the passage, the long passage that we read today. This is fulfillment. This is the Gospel. And Gospel means good news. One of the central emphases in Mark's telling of the good news of Jesus is this mysterious question, who is Jesus? How does Jesus reveal himself? Early in his ministry, the demons and Satan himself know who Jesus is because they have the most to lose by his victorious battle over sin and death. Curiously, in this gospel, the ones who follow Jesus, the ones who draw close to Jesus, the ones who commit themselves to Jesus are the last to understand and truly the weakest of all the characters. Did you notice in this gospel passage of Jesus' passion, it began with a nameless woman who anoints Jesus with extraordinarily precious perfume. Worth 300 days wages. That's almost a year's salary on this little bit of perfume with which she anoints Jesus. 
she recognized who Jesus was. And she recognized in this worn Savior, in this very human Savior, in this very Savior who looked so much like anyone else, the long-awaited Messiah. Maybe she was one among the crowds when he entered Jerusalem. But that night, she knew who he was, and she anointed him. The name Messiah means the anointed one. And she anointed him with the most precious anointing she could find. She was criticized for wasting resources and wasting money by those who supposedly had more concern about the poor. And the very next verse, the very next verse after this lavish anointing by a woman who knew the lavish mercy that Jesus proclaimed, the lavish love of God that he poured out and made real for so many people through his ministry of healing and preaching, in the very next verse, one of the twelve cashes in on Jesus, makes a deal, gets money to turn him over. Yeah, they were concerned about the poor, all right. Jesus, who identified with the poor, who lifted up the poor, who proclaimed the poor blessed, who brought the poor into right relationship with God, who became one of the poor, not owning the donkey he rode in on, not owning the tomb in which he was laid. What were the disciples doing? In one moment, they're bragging about each one of them. They would give their life for Jesus, and Peter, the first among them, till Jesus has to put him in his place. And even then, he doesn't believe what Jesus is telling him, but Jesus knows the script. You'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. And Peter wasn't the only one. Judas had already made money on the deal. Peter can't stand up to anybody when it comes down to it. And the disciples turn and run when Judas gives him the kiss. They're all departed. Even before that, when Jesus asked them to be with him as he was with them, they couldn't stay awake once, twice, three times when he's depending on their emotional support, their sound asleep, some kind of disciples he has. Isn't this a call for our own examination of conscience about our discipleship? Is our discipleship asleep? when Jesus needs us to bear witness? Is our discipleship about making a profit when Jesus needs us to be generous? Is our discipleship about denying the one who gives meaning to our life and has promised us life everlasting with himself? Betrayal is a common theme of this story and one that adds to the physical suffering and perhaps even surpasses it. Yet Jesus remains faithful even when he can't sense or feel the faithfulness of his Father. He knows it's there. And that's where Jesus gives us the example. To trust in his Father who in the midst of all kinds of pain and suffering will bring out something so good that we can't even begin to imagine it. And notice who else believed. Who was there at the cross? It was the women. Some mentioned by name, Mary and Mary and Mary and Salome and others who were nameless, just like the woman who anointed Jesus were nameless. But many of them who accompanied him from Galilee to Jerusalem were there. And they were there to lay him in the tomb. Which role is ours? Can we be faithful in this face of death? Can we be faithful in the trials and disturbances of life? Can we be faithful when God seems far away? Or is it just easier to cash in? Is it just easier to go to sleep? Is it just easier to go on as if this triumphal entry never happened at all? That's the question that we are to live with during this Holy Week. That's the question that we are to ponder as we enter in and follow Jesus 
but we know the script just as much as Jesus did. And we know that that burial is not the end of the story. If we want to continue the story as Jesus did, then let's ask for the grace to be faithful, to bear witness, to honor and worship the anointed one, to accept our cross and follow him so that our sufferings too may be transformed into glory.